Hello everybody and welcome to another creepy tale, another creepy read aloud. This time um, we are headed back into vampire fiction. I will be reading for you uh, The Tomb of Sarah by F.G. Loring. Uh, he was a very interesting individual. He was actually a, he was English. He was a naval officer. And all around, when you read about him, just a, a very interesting sounding um, individual. Uh, he received a medal for bravery for saving lives. He was one of the first, uh, one of the first people to specialize in wireless technology. So that turn of the century, telegraphy, telegraph, wireless. It's not a subject I really know a whole lot about, but it's interesting to me because um, this man comes across, uh, to me at least, as being rather science-minded, technology-minded. And it's so uh, interesting to me that because he, he did write, he did, um, he apparently wrote a lot in, in technical journals, as, as one would assume, given uh, his background, but he also wrote poetry and short stories, one of which is, of course, The Tomb of Sarah. It's just, he's just not the kind of person that you would really think of as being um, a creative writer in general, but in particular dealing with um, paranormal. Uh, creative writing as well, and I just think he just he just seems very interesting to me for that reason because he's not someone you would really think of as who who would be the kind of person you would imagine would delve into uh, this particular this particular genre. So the Tomb of Sarah is uh, one of these important ones in that it does feature a female vampire, which um, you tend to find more of in the very early uh, additions to uh, the, gen the genre, so uh, Carmilla, The Tomb of Sarah, uh, a couple others. Um, in the, the modern era, I, I le at least to me, I, admittedly I don't watch a ton of vampire-related modern media content, but it seems to me that there disproportionately a, a lot of, of vampires in the, the modern genre are male, and if you go back to when the when it was really taking off this idea of vampire fiction being sort of mass mass consumed and people really getting into it and it's I wouldn't say it was an even split necessarily because I haven't read nearly enough of it to be able to to make that call but just uh, there does seem to be more representations of women as vampire as opposed to vampires victim and you could make, and people I'm sure have, made very uh, interesting arguments about the female vampire in the Victorian era, or even at the turn of that century, as representing a sort of femme fatale figure, and the, the act of sucking um, blood and life force being sort of synonymous with, with sex and, and that sort of thing. And it, it, is, it is interesting, because of course, although, you know, more female vampires that the type of person that that female vampire is is representing is still very much that very alluring threat of entrapment to uh, a male protagonist you even see that um in dracula with the the blue for lady and, and uh, which i might have mentioned previously anyway it's interesting to me and if it is interesting to you um Definitely look more into that. I, of course, am not the most well-spoken or well-read on the, on the genre, and I'm sure people who are much better at it than I am have um, probably written entire graduate degrees on this subject. I'm, I'm sure that exists. Uh, before we get into it, the usual preamble in that this is, well, this is actually 1900, so it's bang on the, the turn of the previous century. But again, you know, we are likely going to come across attitudes, either explicit or implied, about things like um, gender, race, religion, orientation, that kind of thing that will probably be distasteful to modern ears. So please use your judgment whether or not you feel that this particular story is suitable for you. 
as with the previous video, I'm going to try and keep my comments to myself until the end, although I will say my plan is to split this into two parts, just because it is a bit of a longer one, and I have learned my lesson from reading uh, The Vampire and a couple others that were sort of on the longer side, and it really um, does leave me with a, a sore throat by the end of the evening, because of course the video that you see is not my, uh, not my first take. So I've usually been doing it, you know, all afternoon or all day trying to, trying to get the best, the best possible version. So come evening, you know, I, I pay for it sometimes. So this one is shorter than The Vampire for sure, but I have decided in the interests of self-care to split this one into two parts. So it'll be the same format for both. I will focus on the reading of the story and then have comments at the end. And as per usual, if you are enjoying this, in the comment section below, please feel free to leave a suggestion or a request for something you would, uh, you would like me to read aloud. Pardon me. Yes, it is a little Halloween, um, water bottle kind of thing. I thought it was adorable, and I love Halloween decorations and that sort of thing, as, I, as I'm sure you've probably guessed, so that, that had to come home. Oh, uh, without any more um, of me rambling about stuff that you aren't necessarily here for, uh, we will get into it. The Tomb of Sarah by F.G. Loring My father was the head of a celebrated firm of church restorers and decorators about 60 years ago. He took a keen interest in his work and made an especial study of any old legends or family histories that came under his observation. He was necessarily very well read and thoroughly well posted in all questions of folklore and medieval legend. Pardon the hiccup there. As he kept a careful record of every case he investigated, the manuscripts he left at his death have a special interest. From amongst them I have selected the following as being particularly weird and, extraordinarily ex and an extraordinary experience and presenting it to the public, I feel it is superfluous to apologize for its supernatural character. My Father's Diary, 1841 June 17. Received a commission from my old friend Peter Grant to enlarge and restore the chancel of his church at Hagerstone in the wilds of the West Country. July 5th. Went down to Hagerstone with my head man, Summers. A very long and tiring journey. July 7th. Got the work well started. <clears throat> Being an old church, it is one of special interest to the antiquarian, and I shall endeavor, while restoring it, to alter the existing arrangements as little as possible. One large tomb, however, must be moved bodily ten feet, at least, to the southward. Curiously enough, there is a somewhat forbidding inscription upon it in Latin, and I am sorry that this particular tomb should have to be moved. It stands, to, it stands amongst the graves of the Kenyans, an old family which has been extinct in these parts for centuries. The inscription on it runs thus. Sarah, 1630. The sake of the dead and the welfare of the living, let this sepulcher remain untouched and its occupant undisturbed till the coming of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. July 8th took counsel with Grant concerning the Sarah tomb. We are both very loath to disturb it, but the ground has sunk so beneath it that the safety of the church is in danger, thus we have no choice. However, the work shall be done as reverently as possible under our own direction. Grant says there is a legend in the neighborhood that it, it is the tomb of the last of the Kenyans, the evil Countess Sarah, who was murdered in 1630. She lived quite alone in the old castle, whose ruins still sit, stand three miles from here, on the road to Bristol. Her reputation was an evil one for those days. She was a witch or werewoman, the only companion of her solitude being a familiar in the shape of a huge Asiatic wolf. This creature was reputed to seize upon children, or failing these, sheep and other small animals, and convey them to the castle, where the countess used to suck their blood. It was popularly supposed that she could never be killed, 
This, however, proved a fallacy, since she was strangled one day by a mad peasant woman who had lost two children. She declared that they had both been seized and carried off by the Countess's familiar. This is a very interesting story, since it points to a local superstition very similar to that of the vampire, existing in Slavonic and Hungarian Europe. The tomb is built of black marble, surmounted by an enormous slab of the same material. On the slab is a magnificent group of figures. A young and handsome woman reclines upon a couch. Round her neck is a piece of rope, the end of which she holds in her hand. At her side is a gigantic dog with bared fangs and lolling tongue. The face of the reclining figure is a cruel one. Corners of the mouth are curiously lifted, showing the sharp points of long canine or dog teeth. The whole group, though magnificently executed, leaves a most unpleasant sensation. If we move the tomb, it will have to be done in two pieces, the covering slab first and then the tomb proper. We have decided to remove the covering slab tomorrow. July 9th, 6 p.m. A very strange day. By noon, everything was ready for lifting off the covering stone, and after the men's dinner, we started the jacks and pulleys. The slab lifted easily enough, though it fit if fitted closely into its seat and was further secured by some sort of mortar or putty, which we must, excuse me, which must have kept the interior perfectly airtight. None of us were prepared for the horrible rush of foul, moldy air that escaped as the cover lifted clear of its seating, and the contents that gradually came into view were more startling still. There lay the fully dressed body of a woman, wizened and shrunk and ghastly pale as if from starvation. Round her neck was a loose cord, and, judging by the scars still visible, the story of death of strangulation was true enough. The most horrible part, however, was the extraordinary freshness of the body. Except for the appearance of starvation, life might have been only just extinct. The flesh was soft and white. The eyes were wide open and seemed to stare at us with a fearful understanding in them. The body itself lay on mold without any pretense to coffin or shell. For several moments we gazed with horrible curiosity and then it became too much for my workmen, who implored us to replace the covering slab. That, of course, we would not do, but I had set the carpenters to work at once to make a temporary cover while we moved the tomb to its new position. This is a long job and will take two or three days at least. July 9th. Just at sunset, we were startled by the howling of, seemingly, every dog in the village. It lasted for ten minutes or a quarter of an hour and then ceased as suddenly as it began. This and a curious mist that has risen round the church makes me feel rather anxious about the Sarah tomb. According to the best established traditions of vampire haunted countries, the disturbance of dogs or wolves at sunset is supposed to indicate the presence of one of these fiends, and local fog is always considered to be a certain sign. The vampire has the power of producing it for the purpose of concealing its movements near its hiding place at any time. I dare not mention or even hint my fears to the rector. For he is, not unnaturally perhaps, a rank disbeliever in many things that I know, from experience, are not only possible but even probable. I must work this out alone at first, and get his aid without his knowing in what direction he is helping me. I shall now watch till midnight at least. 10.15 p.m. As I feared and half expected, just before ten there was another outburst of the hideous howling. It was commenced most distinctly by a particularly horrible and blood-curdling wail from the vicinity of the churchyard. The chorus lasted only a few minutes, however, and at the end of it I saw a large dark shape, like a huge dog, emerge from the fog and lope away at a rapid canter towards the open country. Assuming this to be what I fear, I shall return, I shall see it, pardon me, Assuming this is to be what I fear, I shall see it return soon after midnight. 
12.30 p.m. I was right. Almost as midnight struck, I saw the beast returning. It stopped at the spot where the fog seemed to commence, and lifting its head gave tongue to that particularly horrible, long-drawn wail that I had noticed as preceding the outburst earlier in the evening. Tomorrow I shall tell the rector what I have seen, and if, as I suspect, we hear some of the neighboring sheepfold having been raided, I shall get him to watch with me for this nocturnal marauder. I shall also examine the Sarah tomb for something which he may notice without any previous hint from me. July 10th. I found the workmen this morning much disturbed in mind about the howling of the dogs. We don't like it, sir, one of them said to me. We don't like it. There was some at about abroad last night. That was unholy. They were still more uncomfortable when the news came round that a large dog had made a raid upon a flock of sheep, scattering them far and wide, and leaving three of them dead with torn throats in the field. When I told the rector of what I had seen and what was being said in the village, he immediately decided we must try and catch sight, or at least identify the beast I had seen. Of course, said he, it is some dog lately imported into the neighborhood for I know of nothing about here nearly as large as the animal you describe, though its size may be due to the deceptive moonlight. This afternoon I asked the rector, as a favor, to assist me in lifting the temporary cover that was on the tomb, giving as an excuse the reason that I wished to obtain a portion of the curious mortar with which it had been sealed. After a slight demur, he consented, and we raised the lid. If there was a sight that met her... Pardon me, if the sight that met our eyes gave me a shock, at least it appalled Grant. Great God, he exclaimed, the woman is alive! And so it seemed for a moment. The corpse had lost much of its starved appearance and looked hideously fresh and alive. It was still wrinkled and shrunken, but the lips were firm and of the rich red hue of health. The eyes, if possible, were more appalling than ever, though fixed and staring. At one corner of the mouth, I thought I noticed a slight, dark-colored froth, but I said nothing about it then. Take your piece of mortar, Harry, gasped Grant, and let us shut the tube again. God help me, parson though I am, such dead faces frighten me. Nor was I sorry to hide that terrible face again, but I got my bit of mortar, and I have advanced—and excuse me—and I have advanced a step towards the solution of the mystery. This afternoon, the tomb was moved several feet towards its new position, but will be two or three days yet before we shall be ready to replace the slab. 10.15 p.m. Again, the same howling at sunset, the same fog enveloping the church, and at ten o'clock, the same great beast slipping silently out into the open country. I must get the rector's help and watch for its return, but precautions we must take. For if the things are as I believe, we take our lives in our hands when we venture out into the night to waylay the vampire. Why not admit it at once? For that the beast I have seen, as the vampire of that evil thing in the tomb, I can have no reasonable doubt. Not yet come to its full strength, thank heaven, after the starvation of nearly two centuries, for at present it can only maraud as wolf, apparently. But in a day or two, when full power returns, that dreadful woman and a new strength and beauty will be able to leave her refuse. Then it would not be sheep merely that would satisfy her disgusting lust for blood, but victims that would yield their lifeblood without a murmur to her caressing touch. Victims that, dying of her foul embrace themselves, must become vampires and in their turn prey on others. Mercifully, my knowledge gives me a safeguard, for that little piece of mortar that I had rescued today from the tomb contains a portion of the sacred host, and who holds it, humbly and firmly believing in its virtue, in its virtue, may pass safely through such an ordeal as I intend to submit myself and the rector tonight. <clears throat> 10.30 p.m. Our adventure is over for the present, and we are back safe. 
After writing the last entry recorded above, I went off to find Grant and tell him that the marauder was out on the prowl again. But Grant, I said, before we start out tonight, I must insist that you will let me prosecute this affair in my own way. You must promise to put yourself completely under my orders without asking any questions as to the why and wherefore. After a little demur and some excusable chaff on his part at the serious view I was taking of what he called a dog hunt, he gave me his promise. I then told him that we were to watch tonight and to try and track the mysterious beast, but not to interfere with it in any way. I think, in spite of his jests, that I impressed him with the fact that there might be, after all, good reason for my precautions. It was just after eleven when we stepped out into the still night. Our first move was to try and penetrate the dense fog round the church, but there was something so chilly about it, and a faint smell so disgustingly rank and loathsome that neither our nerves nor our stomachs were proof against it. Instead, we stationed ourselves in the dark shadow of a yew tree that commanded a good view of the wicket entrance to the courtyard, to the churchyard. <clears throat> At midnight, the howling of the dogs began again, and, a few, and in a few minutes we saw a large grey shape with green eyes shining like lamps shamble swiftly down the path towards us. The rector started forward, but I laid a firm hand upon his arm and whispered a warning. Remember! Then we both stood very still and watched as the great beast cantered swiftly by. It was real enough, for we could hear the clicking of its nails on the stone flags. It passed within a few yards of us and seemed to be nothing more or less than a great grey wolf, thin and gaunt with bristling hair and dripping jaws. It stopped where the mist commenced and turning round, it was truly a horrible sight and made one's blood run cold. The eyes burnt like fires. The upper lip was snarling and raised, showing the great canine teeth, while the round mouth while round the mouth clung and gripped a dark-colored rock. It raised its head and gave tongue to its long, wailing howl, which was answered from afar by the village dogs. After standing for a few moments, it turned and disappeared into the thickest part of the fog. Very shortly afterwards, the atmosphere began to clear, and within ten minutes, the mist was all gone. The dogs in the village were silent, and the night seemed to resume its normal aspect. We examined the spot where the beast had been standing and found, plainly enough upon the stone flags, dark spots of broth and saliva. Well, Rector, I said, will you admit now, in view of the things you have seen today, in consideration of the legend, the woman in the tomb, the fog, the howling dogs, and last but not least, the mysterious beast you have seen so close, that there is something not quite normal in it all? Will you put yourself unreservedly in my hands and help me, whatever I may do, whatever I may do, to first make assurance double sure, and finally take the necessary steps for putting an end to this horror of the night? I saw that the uncanny influence of the night was strong upon him, and wished to impress it as much as possible. Needs must, he replied. When the devil drives, and in the face of what I have seen, I must believe that some unholy forces are at work. Yet how can they work in the sacred precincts of a church? Shall we not rather call upon heaven to, ins to assist us in our need? Grant, I said solemnly, that we must do, each in his own way. God helps those who help themselves, and by his help and the light of my knowledge, we must fight this battle for him and the poor lost soul within. When we, <clears throat> pardon me, we then returned to the rectory and to our rooms, though I have sat up to write this account while the scene is still fresh in my mind. And that is where I will leave it for today. That is the first half of The Tomb of Sarah by F.G. Loring. I quite like it. Um, I find you can still see uh, some aspect of the, the naval officer in our main character here in that he wants to take charge and come up with the, the solution himself. And I also like this, this implication that, um, at least in, in, this, in this story, you know, 
the the vampire woman Sarah, Countess Sarah, she um, was uh, strangled to death by a, a peasant woman. So no need for silver or wooden stakes or um, any of those things uh, in in this world. Apparently, you can just strangle uh, not not only strangle the the vampire. But you can also like etch that into the covering of uh, of her tomb, as if you recall from the description, uh, the the carving on on this on this dead pseudo dead woman's tomb is actually a depiction of her <laughs> laying there strangled, which seems like a big kind of a big fuck you to Countess Sarah inside. But they've they've sort of advertised what what has happened to her and what her what her end was on the the door to her to her tomb i also like the idea that this this vampire has been woken because of a, a church restoration where they they've had to move her tomb so she's not this um creature that's been roaming the earth ever since uh she was created she's definitely had a time period where someone got her and um she has had to just essentially wait for, you know, 200, 100, 200, I don't, don't remember exactly, however many long, long years inside her tomb, basically waiting uh, for someone foolish enough to, uh, to open it and, and let her out. You would think, though, that uh, a rector, although, no, you see that in other media as well, the tends to be a thing, at least in Western media, that the, the Christian rector, priest, pastor, whatever you want to call them, in a lot of cases doesn't believe in, in any of it, and the only real thing is God, and God's help is the only help you need. And So it's interesting to see that even this early on in, in the genre, that, that trope is kind of, kind of already a, a thing, which I thought was kind of cool to see the the start of that already unless of course it's a catholic priest because of course uh catholic priests are apparently the ones you you call upon when you are in need of an exorcism so thank you for joining me for uh the first half of this spooky story i will uh be posting this um and then the second half of it so you will find out the exciting conclusion of the tomb of sarah if you have enjoyed this video, please uh, give it a like, feel free to subscribe, and as I said at the beginning, if there is something you would like me to uh, read aloud for you, please uh, do leave that down in the comment section and I will see what I can do. So thank you for being here with me today, I hope you've enjoyed. Have a good afternoon, evening, weekend, wherever you are in your day when you're watching this video. So bye everyone! Bye.